Did you know that the whole family, not just children, can benefit by drinking water that contains fluoride? It's a fact that in addition to brushing and flossing, the best way to keep your teeth is to drink fluoridated water. We consume it every day with the reassurance from our health authorities that it is doing us good. The truth is fluoride is a poison and adding it to our drinking water is an evolving social experiment started 40 years ago. In a small county of Elbit, Georgia, on one of the highest hilltops, stands a massive granite structure known as the Georgia Guidestones. Perfectly aligned with celestial bodies, this American Stonehenge was erected sometime in the late 70s. The enormous structure stands almost 20 feet high, is made of six granite slabs weighing in at almost a quarter of a million pounds. The most astonishing detail of the monument is not its size, but the messages that are carved into it. Engraved in eight modern and four ancient languages are Ten Commandments for a new age of reason. The first directive is the most sinister and alarming to us all. Maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. I have a question for you. How do you suppose they plan on eliminating over 90% of the population? Perhaps by using the oldest trick in the book, and that is to do it right under our noses, then cloak it in the phrase, it's all for your own good. This series of films takes a closer look at the current pandemic of neurological disorders we are witnessing today, and more importantly, the relationship that heavy metal toxicity plays in the overall equation. Our food, our air, and our water are all under attack, and the most disturbing part is that it's by design. This first of three films investigates our water by focusing on fluoride. My name is Chris Maple, and this is our story. So we got our friends at the Fluoride Action Network. We actually went to their website and printed off a top 10 facts about fluoride. Hopefully we can educate a few people on what's going on with the drinking water. Do you drink tap water? Um, yes, I do. Yes. Yes, I do. Yes. Yes. I do drink tap water, but I usually put it through a filter system. Filtered. Filtered tap water, yeah. yeah. Yeah, one of those like little jugs with the, like the carbon filter that comes in there. If it's an emergency situation, I need to, you know, swallow a, a, a pill or something, yeah, but... No, I don't drink it. No. You don't drink the tap water? No. I don't drink it for recreation when I get thirsty. I boil my water, I wait for it to cool, I store it in jars. Yeah, don't want to take any risks. Let me ask you, what made you go and buy that filter? Because L.A. water tastes like crap. <laughs> well, I know what's in it. It's pretty nasty. Have you heard of the fluoride controversy that's going on? No, no. No, never. You just, actually, this is the first time? It's a surprise for me. Have you heard of uh, fluoride? Yes. yes what, do you, what do you know about it? It's something that's added to water. Mm -hmm. I don't know like the scientific exact definition. Apparently fluoride ions help out with keeping your teeth strong and everything else like that. I always thought it was kind of like a medicine because it helps your teeth be stronger and all that fun stuff. I know that it's one of the questions that our dentist asks us about if we have fluoride in our toothpaste, mm -hmm. but that's about all I really know. I don't know if it's a positive thing or not. So why do you think, why is it added to the water? What do you think? To like, you know what, I'm not sure. Well, my dad was a dentist. Okay. So I know fluoride as far as dental health is necessary. Okay. Particularly for kids that don't learn how to brush their teeth, their parents, may or may not be aware of what sugar can do to their teeth. So, in my opinion, fluoride's a good thing. Fluoride is safe and effective, and it's one of the most inexpensive ways to really cut down on dental decay. Anything we can do to help prevent cavities on children, I think, is very important. Absolutely, fluoride is safe. It's effective. Fluoridation of community water is extremely safe and extremely effective in preventing tooth decay. Science is on the side of fluoride being safe and effective. There is no controversy about this in the scientific community. If it's such a simple issue, how is it that it's still going on 
after half a century. I remember it being debated yeah, well, 30 years ago. And, and, and it's probably. continuously debated. But just because we've been doing something 50 years doesn't necessarily mean that it's right. Uh, public health officials knew then what they know now. Would we have fluoride? Would it be added to our drinking water? Well, today a coalition of scientists, dentists, and doctors are taking action to stop fluoridation until it is proven safe. As I began my quest looking into the history of fluoride, I found what seemed to be a tangled web of information. While we agree that there are a number of different players in this game and paths to explore regarding the history on fluoride, for the sake of time, we will attempt to be as concise as possible. In the last part of the 18th century, a new kind of revolution was taking hold of the modern world. This was not a political, social, or cultural revolution. This was an economic revolution, and unfortunately for us, the byproducts was some of the most toxic pollutants humanity had ever seen. And one of the most venomous pollutants of them all was fluoride. By 1930, the aluminum industry was the biggest polluter of fluoride. In America, only one company was in the aluminum business. The Aluminum Company of America, otherwise known as Alcoa. Ironically enough, during that time, the U.S. Public Health Services was under the direct jurisdiction of the U.S. Treasury Secretary, Andrew W. Mellon. It just so happened that Mellon was a founder and major stockholder of Alcoa. He was also the founder of the Mellon Institution, an industry-funded research institute that was notorious for giving industry the scientific data it needed to defend itself. The Mellon Institute published some of the key evidence that supported the effectiveness of fluoride in fighting tooth decay. It was Dr. Gerald Cox who also worked at the Mellon Institute that made the first proposal to artificially fluoridate our public water supplies. Although widely debated, the official human experiments began in Grand Rapids, Michigan on January 25, 1945, as they were the first to publicly fluoridate their water supply. Uh, you guys want to know what fluoride is? I mean, that's what we're going to do over the next 12 months, is our hope is to interview people like yourself, various physicians, neurologists, chemists, toxicologists, and, and, and get to the bottom of it. I mean, I don't understand why there's a debate. Yeah. We want to get to the bottom of what is fluoride. Is it good or is it bad? Okay. Well, more importantly, Mike, we'd like to come down and see you. How do you feel about that? Yeah, we can do it at my studio if you'd like. Oh, that'd be great. Okay, I got a lot of hosting out shows today. Yeah, all right, I know you're busy, buddy. I'll let you go. All right, Chris. See you soon, man. Okay, sounds good, Mike. Bye-bye. That's awesome. My name is Mike Adams, the health ranger, the editor of naturalnews.com. What is labeled fluoride is not naturally occurring fluoride, like you might find in the ground. It's actually a collection. It can be over a hundred different chemicals, including some radioactive chemicals, including many cancer-causing chemicals, including heavy metals, uh, neurologically damaging elements, that are called fluoride. And then this is dumped into the water supply, and the cities have the doctors and dentists convinced that this is somehow good for your teeth. So this topic, this, this fluoride topic, has been going on, discrepancy, there, there for 60 years now. There must be an organization that is trying to push fluoride. Otherwise, it wouldn't be going into communities the way it is. So I think there's an organized group that are trying to influence cities and convince them. Two thirds of the water districts in this country fluoridate, but not San Diego. 80% of our 50 largest cities fluoridate, but not San Diego. Now that the water district is introducing fluoride, we have a unique opportunity to really make sure that this incredibly cost-effective public health advance gets to everyone in the city of San Diego and I urge you to consider that. Since Grand Rapids began fluoridating in 1945, cities all over America have been slowly following suit. According to the CDC in 2010, over 73 percent of the public's water supplies are fluoridated. Presently, San Diego now finds itself in over a half century long fight to keep fluoride out of its water supply. That brings us to this man who has been on the front lines of this fluoride battle since the beginning. Well, my name is David Kennedy. DDS, because I'm a dentist. Graduated in 1971 from the University of Missouri at Kansas City. I have a degree in biochemistry and physiology from the University of Kansas and graduated from there in 1967. 
Dr. Kennedy, thanks so much for spending some time with us today and, and agreeing to meet with us at your house. You have a beautiful place here in sunny San Diego. Twice, San Diego voters have rejected it, 1954 and 1968. Now we're trying to put fluoride back into our water and we're dead set against it. After years of debate, this water will have fluoride. San Diego has a long history of fighting fluoridation. It's the largest city in the country not to put the material in the water. There are people who think it's you know, absolutely fantastic that we're doing this. Arian Collins is the city's water department spokesman. He says the city's desire to put fluoride in the water has nothing to do with improving dental health. It has to do with potential fines from the state. The city really doesn't take sides on the health issue itself. I mean, the city really has to abide by the state law. I mean, there's no question about it. If we would, we would receive major fines from the state if we did not comply. Now, there's no turning back. There's no flavor or uh, odor taste at all to the water that will make any difference. Uh, people, it'll taste and, and smell just like the same as it does now. Odor's not Jeff Green's problem. It's not just the fluoride itself. He's already sued the city yeah. once over the issue. It's the fact that when you add something to the water to treat humans, unfortunately what they've done is they've skipped all the other processes that they would usually look at when you're going to put something in the water. Green says fluoride puts more arsenic, lead, and other metals in the system. He says it'll all end up in court again. So you're talking legal action, presumably? I'm certain that it'll probably have to be legal action. Fluoride will be in the entire water supply by the end of the month. John Langler, Fox 5 News. 50 plus years now, San Diego's been fighting this battle successfully. What just happened? The story, if you go back to the history in California for fluoridation, more than 110 times cities had rejected fluoridation in California. The city council voted in 1952 to put hydrofluosilicic acid in our water supply. The citizens walked around and they said, we don't think that's a good idea, and we passed a law that says no fluoride or fluorine-containing substance or hydrofluosilicic acid can be added to the public water supply. There can be no gift of funds, no tax, and no water bill levied for that purpose. Even as far back as 1952, they were actually able to name the product that was going to end up being put in the water that we now have to spend all of our time on. And it's uh, ordinance number 67 in the San Diego Municipal Code. It still stands? It still stands today. And we, what we have is a bunch of crooks and thieves in downtown City Hall. And they decided, well, you know, that's such an old law. Mayor Goldigger actually said that's such an old law. Well, you know, let's see, the Constitution is 200 years old. Shall we throw that out too, Mayor? <laughs> San Diego is not being forced to fluoridate. They're doing voluntarily against the law that we have in our community. So what do you do about that? Then the only thing I know to do about that is exactly what all the people in Libya and, and Egypt and, and the Middle East did is that when you get sick and tired of the totalitarian approach to government where they says you will drink it, you're gonna like it, we decided you need to have hazardous waste in your water supply and you gotta stand up and say, you know what? You drink it, because I don't want it. This is a sad day where the citizens of uh, San Diego lost again. We held them off for 60 years, and here they are, buying Chinese hazardous waste, put in the water supplies of San Diego, directly against our wishes. If you catch the citizens asleep, you can take their rights away, and that's what they did. That's what it was. People just, you know, are not savvy enough to be able to figure out that the hazardous waste from China is not what's going to prevent tooth decay. Eating right and taking care of your teeth is what prevents tooth decay. This is about your rights. This is a civil right. Are we going to put stuff in the water that harms children? We shouldn't. Well, we did. Well, hello there. Hey, Chris, how you Hi, doing? How are you? Good to see Good you. Good to see you, too. Nice to meet you. Thanks for inviting us out here in such a short notice. Oh, you bet. You bet. And I'm glad the weather showed up nicely. So you ready to talk about some fluoride or what? You bet I'm ready. As we know, it's a, a pretty important topic. It sure is, but a misunderstood topic by most people. Yeah, you're right. And hopefully we, we're here today to, you know, to gather a little more clarity around the issue and I'm hoping maybe you might be able to help us with it. Okay. When they first started using fluoride, they used sodium fluoride and sodium fluoride that we were able to get from the aluminum industry. Well, the fluoride that is being put in the water now, not back in 1940, 1950, that was sodium fluoride. Now, it's a mineral. It's coming from the phosphate fertilizer industry. It's a byproduct that is a very toxic waste. It's basically fluoride bound to silica, okay? And it's called fluorosilicic acid when it's put in extremely toxic. Fluoride is really a clever way for industry, the mining industry, 
uh, chemical processing industries, aluminum smelting and processing industries, to eliminate their toxic industrial waste without having to pay for it to be handled as industrial waste. They just slap a new label on it, fluoride. They sell it to cities, and the cities dump it into the water supply. The water in Amesbury is supposed to have fluoride in it, but Rob Damaris has been concerned for years about what's in the supply he gets from China. The residue you see here is what won't dissolve when he puts the fluoride powder in the water. What is that? We don't know. You have no idea what's in there? I don't know what it is. It's not soluble. and It doesn't appear to be sodium fluoride, so we're not quite sure what it is. But they should test it to make sure that what they're putting in is safe for us to drink. For almost a year, these fluoride pumps in Amesbury have been off, and the water department says they'll stay off until they can figure out what's in the fluoride. Since 2007, most of the sodium fluoride has also been imported from China because it's the least expensive on the market. I don't think that when it comes to something that I ingest every day, the lowest bidder is good enough. I'd like to be able to add it in, you know, worry-free. But despite those concerns, we want to be clear. Both state and federal health officials tell Team 5 Investigates Chinese fluoride is safe. So who, who do you think we should talk to next? I mean, you know anybody that... You know, coming to town uh, is Paul Conant. Uh, he's an excellent uh, professor of chemistry. All the chemistry professors in the world think this stuff is bad because, you know, it burns holes in the countertop and stuff like that. So Paul would be a really good guy for you to talk to. My name is Paul Conant. I am a retired professor of chemistry. I taught at St. Lawrence University from 1983 and retired in May of 2006. And my speciality was environmental chemistry and toxicology. <laughs> Most people in America are persuaded that everybody fluoridates their water. And you, if you're living in a town like Albany or Long Island or Ithaca or somewhere, but the vast majority of the population of the world does not drink fluoridated water. Most of the countries do not fluoridate their water, only about 30. The countries now that have banned the use of fluoride, uh, China, Austria, Belgium, Finland, Germany, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, the Netherlands, Hungary, and Japan. These, all these countries have said that fluoride, number one, is ineffective and toxic and should not be used. We are still using it. There's something wrong here. I think it's time that uh, we become aware and do something about it. How come? Our country that's supposed to be, quote, so smart, uses it. Well, there's something going on here. What does the European Union know that we don't know? Nothing, nothing. They know the same thing, that's why, but the difference is they're not getting paid off and we are, and so therefore, this is what the only thing I can come up with because they both have the same facts. So both have the same facts. Fluoride is toxic. Fluoride is not helping your teeth. If it was really helping your teeth, why do we have all these dental problems? It's not at all. How come you can go to primitive societies around the world that never had even seen fluoride and they have perfect teeth? Why are we having all these learning disorders? How come we're having autism? We're having all these things we never had before. Well, why don't we ask that question and answer it honestly? Answer it honestly. 98% of Europe does not fluoridate. Only eight countries in the world have more than 50% of their population drinking water. America, Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, Israel, Singapore, Malaysia, and Colombia. Only eight. Yeah. I am from Europe, so I'm really surprised. Yeah. 90% fluoride free. Yeah, Fine. they don't, never you never knew that either? <laughs> okay. Well, they don't really tell a lot of people that statistic. In America here, we are 75% in growing, whereas all the other countries have been banning it. There's two main reasons why European countries explain why they never went along with this American practice. One was they didn't feel it was right to force it on people that didn't want it. And secondly, they didn't think that all the health issues had been resolved. I think Europeans have come to their senses on, on several issues, not all of them, but on many, GMOs being one of them and fluoride being another. They've rejected these things because they're looking at the evidence. America tends to be way behind the curve on really recognizing reality in the realm of, of fraudulent hoax science. 
our CDC and the liars in Washington, D.C. have only had success in countries that speak English for the vast majority of the disposal of their hazardous waste product. That means that you and I and our children in the United States are the largest consumers of hydrofluosilicic acid. Call it what it is. Hydrofluosilicic acid, what is that? Hydro is water, fluo, fluoride, silicic, sand, and it's missing an electron. It's acidic. It'll kill you. You take your hand dipping in like that, and you're gonna die. Hydrofluosilicic acid does not occur in nature. It's a man-made molecule, and it eats through concrete, glass, stainless steel, fiberglass, plastic. You name it, it'll eat it. So why are we putting that in the water? It's toxic. It'll kill you. You touch it, it kills you. Just before they pour it into our drinking water, there's a sculling bones right on the side of the packaging. You need to wear a hazmat suit. First tonight, hazmat crews from all across our area responded to a chemical leak this afternoon in Rock Island. The chemical was so strong that it was burning through the concrete there. News 8's Christy Mergenthal has the latest. It was just before 1 o'clock Thursday afternoon when hazmat crews were called to the Rock Island water treatment plant for a chemical spill coming from this tanker truck. The chemical hydrofluoral sicilic acid is used to add fluoride to the plant's water. After several hours, crews were able to clean up the leak allowing operations to return to normal. They had to cordon off the area, obviously, but as far as uh, the treatment of the water and the, the amount of water uh, you know, being used by the public, there's no effect on that at all. That's how they transport it. It's, it's extremely aggressive. It'll, e it'll eat through almost anything, including concrete. It'll eat through glass, steel, titanium, bricks, anything. It's crazy. Basically, is a hazardous waste byproduct of the manufacture of phosphate fertilizer. It's a mining byproduct. They dig up this rock. This rock is no good, as is. So you mix it with sulfuric acid, and this produces soluble phosphate. And that's what becomes the fertilizer. In doing so, they get all this fluoro silicate in there. It's a byproduct that they can't do anything with. It's a poison. So they sell it and make fluoride out of it. It was a fraud. It was a scam from the get-go. It is a means of getting rid of fluoride. You allow industry to use your water supply to dispose of their hazardous waste. It's a disposal mechanism. It's an industrial, a major industrial waste pollutant. They were trying to dump it into the rivers that were going out into the ocean in Florida, and boy, they stopped that. They said, you're polluting, you're killing the fish, you're, and which they were. For 100 years, they decimated the local vegetation, crippled the cattle, damaged the citrus groves in Florida. It was costing them a fortune to handle this as a very serious industrial waste. And then eventually... Oh, I have an idea. Let's put it in the water supply and we'll get them to take it off our hands. We don't have to pay to get rid of a toxic waste. And now they're making millions of dollars on what is. I, the, now, the, the, if you read, it'll say what was. Well, I don't care what was. It still is an industrial waste product that is being added as our fluoridating agent. And so they're helping Cargill get rid of their hazardous waste problems. Cargill is the largest privately owned corporation in the world. They were also the largest producer of hydrofluosilicic acid. Cargill at one time had like 90% of the market. When the hurricanes went through Florida, they knocked out the holding pond, so there was a shortage of hydrofluosilicic acid. And so they reached out to the rest of the world, and now we get it from Mexico and Japan and China, because none of those countries allow fluoride in the water supply. They don't, they don't put it in at all, so it obviously it's piling up in those countries. I don't think we need to be helping other countries out with their disposal of fluorosilicic acid. Fluoridation is the worst recycling practice in the world, so I support recycling. But to take the hazardous waste from the phosphate fertilizer industry, which cannot be dumped into the sea by international law and cannot be used locally because it's too concentrated. And to take that product and put it into our public drinking water is sheer lunacy. It's bizarre. I mean, George Orwell Kafka could have written this play. It's, it's, it's lunacy. There are 250,000 tons dumped annually in the water supply. Does that sound like a big figure to you? If you had one ton and were worth over a million dollars, you'd be a poor person by the time you got rid of that ton. 
it's extremely expensive to get rid of. Oh, come on, let's think for a moment. Maybe we should be adding cyanide. How about adding cyanide to the water supply? Because now they got all this cyanide somewhere. Now, what are we going to do with it? It's costing us millions to get rid of it. Oh, just add it to the drinking water and we'll, we'll, we'll pay you to add it. That's basically what they're doing with this fluoro silicate. It's, it's almost like if a company could just dump its toxic waste into the river and they said, well, we're just going to dump the, the, the byproducts of uranium refining and enrichment down the river. And we're going to say radiation is good for fish because it makes them brighter. You know, they could sell that on TV. Yeah. They could get on Fox News and CNN and they could tell the whole country, oh, the fish need to be brighter so they can eat at night. Otherwise, they might starve. So we need to save the fish, which means we, we, we need to dump more radiation into the rivers. And that's why this corporation that's enriching the, the plutonium, let's say, or the uranium, is a good corporation that's helping to save the fish. Now, I guarantee you, nine out of 10 people would buy that, even though I just totally made that up and it makes no sense whatsoever. It's complete nonsense. Hydrofluosilicic acid has no known benefit in human or any physiological system. It's not even useful in any mammal. So adding that to the public water supply for an alleged benefit is a fraud and it's a crime against the citizens of this country and it's cumulative over a lifetime. It is a very noxious poison and you do not have to take my word for it. If you've got a Webster's Dictionary, open it up. It, one of the definitions is fluoride, a violent protoplasmic poison. Then you have to go look up protoplasm. We are protoplasm, so violent protoplasm for us. Say, let's put that in the water and see how the kids turn out. Is there anybody that you know that might be willing to talk to us, perhaps a whistleblower, somebody who's been injured or? Yeah, I mean, there's a guy who wrote a book, uh, Toxic Torts, uh, the tell-all book about the phosphate fertilizer industry, Gary Pittman. He'll, he'll tell you the story. Is that where is he out of? In Florida. That's where the, all the phosphate mines are in the United States. That's right. Paul, looks like we're going to Florida, buddy. What do you think? All right, Gary, so, um, Dr. Kennedy um, had forwarded me your name and information and uh, said that you might be willing to talk to us about uh, an injury you uh, incurred at work. Yes, been exposed to a, a lot of chemicals and heavy metals and have numerous health problems from the exposures. And then, you know, of course, that was during my 21 years in the phosphate industry. Wow, 21 years. Now, are you still in the industry? You're still working or...? Stopped working in 1993 due to neurological problems, muscle disease, numerous problems that I didn't know what was going on at the time. Hey, Gary, how are you, my friend? Hey, good to see you. Here we are. We're in Jennings, Florida. We're at uh, Gary Pittman's property with his lovely wife, Gloria been so kind to open up their house to us and, and let us come in and, and pick his brain a little bit about phosphate fluorides. So Gary, what made you write this book? I wanted to leave a history behind on what happened to me and some of the co-workers here in this county. And it kind of gives the inside look at a phosphate plant, mainly the chemical plant where phosphoric acid is made. Former employees of Occidental Chemical Corporation have filed a lawsuit against the company. They say they have life-threatening diseases because the company did not follow safety procedures. Paige, they have diseases like leukemia, emphysema, and toxic brain syndrome. For years, doctors struggled to diagnose them, but finally they found a common link. It was the phosphate plant they all worked for. Gary Pittman started working for Occidental's phosphate plant when he was 18 years old. By 39, he was unable to work. Today, he can barely walk upstairs, suffering from emphysema, chronic bronchitis, heart disorders, liver dysfunction, and a long list of other problems. The diagnosis, toxic brain syndrome. It seemed like everyone over there kept a cold, like flu-like symptoms. Uh, uh, we'd always refer to it as a type of chemical pneumonia. Gary and several other former employees are suing Occidental for failing to provide adequate safety education and gear. We asked our uh, supervisor a lot of times if they would need to paint off of the car while well, it hurt a human. And they would say that the human body wouldn't be able to get rid of that kind of stuff. One woman's husband died of bone cancer before his battle could make it to court. 
They messed up my life. They messed up everybody's life, and they're continuing to mess up other people's lives. They need to come in and realize and to admit to what they are doing. Going into this employment, were you, you know, aware of all the hazards? Or? No, no, not if I tell you, I'd have chosen another career. Uh, I was a pretty smart boy at the time, you know, and I wasn't smart enough, I don't reckon. But see, back in those days, there were no computers. Right. You had no uh, knowledge base like we got today. It was word of mouth. You going to work out there, man, they pay good money, you know. What do they do out there? They make fertilizer. Well, we was farm boys. We handle fertilizer every day. Yeah. Well, Chris, what I wanted to do is I did not want to die without at least trying to warn people and tell people, you know, if, if I could have read a book like the one I wrote before I went to work out there, I wouldn't have went to work out there. Right. Because it would have educated me and said, well, what I want to work with, this guy's sitting there with cancer, or this guy's over here with leukemia. You know, to me, you know, I would have, I would have, I think I'd have chosen another path. What would I say to myself if I was 18 again and, and looking for employment? Well, number one, what I would say to myself is money is not everything. You can't buy your health back once you lose it. If I'd have had the information that I have now, I would have evaluated this whole situation if the company would have told me mm -hmm. about the hazards and what I was going to be exposed to and what it could cause, and they knew. In 1972, when I went to work, the phosphate industry had been going on a long time in Central Florida. They knew the hazards, and they knew what happened to workers working there long term, mm -hmm. and so did my company, but I don't think they tell them today still, huh? I just don't believe they do. Now, they claim they tell them about the hazards, but I don't believe they do because if they did, they wouldn't have any workers. All we were required to wear in the laboratory, that's where I started, was uh, uh, safety glasses. Let me see that old jacket. You can see where it's... It just ate right yeah. through that, huh? You know, you can just be walking out on a pipe rack, so if your acid drip down on your back, I mean, it's gonna burn you. It's gonna burn right through your clothes. No hazmat suits, huh? Just a little jacket. If I never had been that dangerous and know what I know today, I would have never went to work out there to begin with. Let me ask you this. What, what are your thoughts on uh, on taking us over to the, the company that you work at? Well, uh, that might be a little difficult. You know, wouldn't want to get caught out there or anything. They, they have security guards pretty much patrolling that area. But, yeah, we, we, we could go out. I, I could show it to you. How close do you think we can get? Well, you can't see what's on the inside from the ground. You have to get a, a view from the air. And uh, there's some satellite images of all the phosphate mining in Florida. And they have got some great images of the devastation this uh, strip mining causes. Yeah, we, we, we could go out. I, I could show it to you. Up here on the right, we're going to have the administration offices. They used to be in the chemical plant, and they moved them. <laughs> they used to eat the pantyhose off the women's legs. Wow. It says, I worked at the above-named company, Oxdale Chemical Company, White Springs, Florida, in 1968 and part of 1969. Our accounting department was located in the admin building, which at that time was located at the chemical plant. Many mornings when we employees would get out of our vehicles, women, these were, these were secretaries and such, our pantyhose would dissolve off of our legs. It was explained to us that it was a chemical fallout, not to worry. Our boss would see that each of us girls would get one dollar to get us another pair of pantyhose. Well, there's three things you can see from the space station, and that's the Great Pyramids of Egypt, the phosphogypsum stacks of Florida, and the Great Wall of China. And that's how large they are. They, they have them in South Florida and Central Florida that are 400 acres big. It's a huge operation. They dig cubic tons of, 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 of rock a day. What, what is the, what, what the water up, on, up there? The pond water is water they use for the process, and it's recycled. The water is used over and over, and it gets stronger and stronger and more contaminated. 
how do they contain it? Just by building a dam like a that? A dam around it. And that's not what I was fixing to tell you. There's no liner under that stack. It's right on top of the ground, and it is leaching. Sure it is. Into the groundwater. Yeah, what, I, I read somewhere about a sinkhole that took place. The reason the sinkhole developed is because of the acidic water eating away the limestone. And once the limestone gives way, you're in the groundwater. Wow. Because in Florida, when you drill a well, you have to go through the limestone to get to the air. Sure. When that 84 million, million gallons fell through in there, it contaminated all this water around. It had to have. And uh, like I said, you know, it's just a matter of time before, you know, you have a sinkhole like that. It's just a weak point. Wherever there's a weak point in a cavity in the limestone is where the ground eventually, bottom falls. It's eventually going to happen. Yeah, in all of them. In all of them. In addition to this recycled toxic water up there in those, in those ponds, those ponds you call them, uh, they're, in addition to that, they're taking fresh water too, right? Of course, they use a lot of fresh water because see, this is the main thing that they don't want you to know. It's what they call the water balance. It just makes them nervous if you start talking about the water balance. What do they add back when they need water if it's leaching? Right. It's going away, so right. they have to add some fresh water I see. to keep the process going. Right. The phosphate industry uses more fresh water than any other industry in the state of Florida. You know, when, and sometimes they have to release water out of those toxic ponds. And what do they put it? They put it in the creeks and it runs into the Swanee River. Now what they do to it is lime it to bring the pH up so it don't kill the fish immediately. The Swanee River, they claim is a pristine waterway. But if you ask the Fresh and Game Water Commission in Florida, They'll tell you not to eat over one fish out of that river a month. Wow. Because of lead and mercury and chromium and cadmium. They won't tell you that, but that's why. Yeah, that's why. This is just a lot of the documentation I've reached through the years. What really caught my eye was like we had talked about earlier, the 1972 through 1979 misrepresenting environmental data. And they charged them $575,000 for emitting 10 times the amount of fluoride allowed by law. And I was working there when that was going on and the fumes were just unbelievable. It pit the, the glass on your windshields, make them so foggy it would etch the glass. Just having your car parked out there while you're at work. I mean, back in the 60s, you know, they, they I mean, even earlier they realized that those fumes were very Strange. toxic. Very toxic. The phosphate company pretty much polices themselves. They have their own crews do their stack testing and, and, and all the other environmental things. And, you know, that's kind of like the fox watching the hen house. And I have been involved where they would go up to test the stack and come down and tell me, says, something's wrong. This stack is going to fail. You know, so you look around, find a problem, straighten it out, and say, okay, boys, y'all can go up there and test now. I have also been at the point to where we couldn't find what was wrong and they were doing the test and we would just go and open a blind in the fume duct to allow more fresh air to rush in so it would dilute the emissions. Well, I know for a fact that they cheat on these tests. Once you know that, then you lose all faith in these regulatory agencies because you know it's all a farce. And this past I'd say six months, there's been four people that I knew of, that I grew up with, they were younger than me, they were 52, all of them, died. And I do honestly believe it has something to do with the, the phosphate. phosphate chemical plants out there. I would imagine you've seen some injured employees. I've seen people burned, I've seen people blown up. Uh, I saw a man killed and he was going to weld on a rotary drum filter somebody had washed it with a solution of sulfuric acid and pond water. Found out later that the guy had struck an arc to weld on that thing and it exploded. And it killed him, messed up his friend too that was helping. But yeah, it's a very hazardous work environment. When you digest phosphate rock with sulfuric acid, that's what you're gonna give off, hydrogen fluoride and silicon tetrafluoride. Now even at that strength, it'll eat up concrete, 
asphalt, stainless steel, even the fume ducts after a while, which is made out of fiberglass. Very corrosive, the most corrosive acid known to man. Used to etch glass, it's used for a lot of things. Uh, one of the things it's used for is to fluoridate drinking water. Who in the world would want to drink water with this stuff in it? So, well, you know, as we're learning, there it seems like there are no rewards to this. It just seems, it's just all risks. It's all risk. It's a big lie. There's no benefit whatsoever. It's all risk. Let's get to the science. That's what I say. Instead of covering it up, let's look at the science. What do these fluoride chemicals actually do to human beings? There's all kinds of research out there showing it really disturbs the functioning of the body in a number of ways. Uh, inactivates 62 enzymes, increases the aging process, increases the incidence of cancers and tumors up to 17%, disrupts the immune system, causes genetic damage, interrupts RNA and DNA, repair enzymes activity, increases arthritis, and is a system poison. These are all validated by scientific data. We have in America today all of the symptoms of hypothyroidism, uh, obesity, heart disease, neurological impairment. I have been very sick. I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism about 10 years ago. There was no family history in my background that explained why I had this thyroid illness. What were some of your side effects? Feeling very cold, um, hair loss, uh, concentration issues. It really controls your metabolism. So I, was, I had gained about 10 to 15 pounds, which is very unusual. I was very athletic my whole life and never was overweight. So I gained weight. I was sleeping a lot. Again, your metabolism is tuned down. Doing the research, fluoride is an uh, irritant to your thyroid. Your thyroid wants iodine. And if it doesn't get iodine at the concentrations that it needs, then it gets whatever is closest that you're providing in the environment. If you look at the periodic table, you see that fluoride, chlorine, bromine, and iodine are all in the same column. That means they have very similar electronic structure and reactivity. So that's why your thyroid will uptake fluoride and chlorine when you're not giving it enough iodine. It's, it's a gradual accumulation of the fluoride and the, and the other things you're exposed to out there that just gradually wears on you through the years. And that's one reason it's hard to pinpoint a health problem. Because, you know, you work out there six, seven, eight, ten years before you start noticing things, and then it's almost too late then because it's already done the damage. But I've been real weak and just lethargic. Yeah. So when the blood work come back, the guy asked me, he said, what have you been doing? I said, uh, nothing the last few days. I've been laying on the couch at home, you know, I ain't felt well. He said, you sure you hadn't fell off of a building or something? He said, look, he said, you have a muscle destructive process going on. That was exactly what he told me. And I said, what, 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 is, what does that mean? He said, you got a muscle destructive process going on and there's nothing I can do to help you. Dave, so what we're learning is Kind of frightening because it seems to me that once it's in your body it's is it there to stay yes you can't get it out you can cut some of the harm by mitigating the damage and avoid it like the plague but you really can't get it out because it's stuck in your bones and that's why you have all the skeletal symptoms you know the, the joint pain the arthritis and all that stuff the first signs that fluoride is poisoning your bones is pains in the joints stiffness in the joints pains in the bones well, you go to the doctor with pain in a joint, and he says, well, you got arthritis. Well, arthritis, arth, joint, rightis, pain. Oh, okay, joint pain. So we got somebody speaking to us in Latin. Oh, you got joint pain, super duper. We have millions of people with arthritis in the United States and in Florida countries, one in three adults. Nobody's ever looked to see if some of those arthritis cases may have been caused or exacerbated by fluoride. Just not looking. Are bones with more fluoride stronger? or less strong, and the answer is less strong. And they got studies where they tried to give them a dose of fluoride, sodium fluoride, to cause an increase in bone mass. It did, but it weakened the bone itself. So those are case-controlled studies. That's the gold standard in medicine. So we have case-controlled studies showing that if you give people fluoride, 
It accumulates in their bones and it causes the bones to become white, opaque, increases the bone density, decreases the bone tensile strength. And they actually took a bone that was removed from people for the purpose of replacing a, a joint or a hip, put it in a little device here where you put a weight on there and snap it. And they showed that the more fluoride in the bone, the quicker it snaps. Do you ever wonder, how come everybody has hip replacements, knee replacements? I mean, you can go on and on. I can think back when I was a kid, it, that didn't happen. You didn't see all these crippled people. I mean, you saw a few, but it wasn't common. I mean, how does it end up in our bones? Is, is that where our body just finds? It, it's calcium-rich tissue, so your body parks it there because it's got to dispose of it some way, otherwise it would kill you. So it parks in the bone, and then it kills your bones. What it does once it fills up with fluoride, that you get little spikes on the outside of the bone. If you take a, a hand and, and take a bone and run, run your hand up and down a normal bone, it's slick, and that's because muscles move around on the bones when you're running or jogging or lifting weights and all that stuff. Your muscles are moving around on your bone, and it's slick, so it doesn't hurt. Well, if you make that bone the texture of sandpaper, then when the muscle moves around, the fascia tears, and it hurts to move. And so fluoride accumulates in calcium-rich tissues, which are bone, ligaments, cartilage, joints, and teeth. So you have to look at this as you have, you have a lifetime body burden, and the, the less you're exposed to, the longer you can go before you develop symptoms. The first most irrefutable symptom of fluoride exposure is pain. And that's what we saw, my wife and I filmed a documentary in China. And pain was the hugely significant symptom that they all had, they couldn't even work. And you know, in China, if you don't work, you starve to death. Have you ever heard of dental fluorosis? No. No. It it's, uh, comes when somebody's overexposed to fluoride. It's awesome. That's a picture of very mild dental fluorosis. And so is that. You know, that young girl came to see me to get that fixed because she doesn't think that's beautiful. She thinks that looks bad when she smiles. And I think everybody else agrees with her. They say 41% of American teenagers have this condition. So this is the white spot. So it's been there. It's, it's a little scary, you know, knowing that many people, we don't even know, you know, what's in our water. Fluorosis can become more severe than a simple white spot. In severe cases, it can deform a patient's teeth. When you see spots on the teeth like this, that means you gave the child enough of a poison that the cells that were making that organ didn't make it right. They made it wrong. When I was a child, I was overexposed to fluoride. There are streaks of that in my teeth. So you learn that early on then? I knew, yes. Those teeth are very brittle, so I have cavities more frequently in those teeth than other ones that don't have the, the evidence of the fluorosis. Maybe you've seen it, it's white chalky spots on your teeth. And I was told that those are calcium buildups. From the fluoride. Okay. Right. I don't think I had really, really strong teeth to start with, but I did have some teeth that they just broke. The last time this happened, I was eating a baked potato and it broke two out. Baked uh, potato. A baked potato and it broke two out. Did you notice anybody else in the plant losing teeth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we talk about it a lot at the plant. So the ADA, the people in office, the people who are in these regulatory agencies, they're aware of overexposure to fluoride causes dental fluorosis, correct? Yeah. They, they know of that, right? And they know that dental fluorosis, the, the, the teeth become weakened, they chip, they fall out. Brown, spotted, ugly wear away real fast. Yes, they know all of that. We took California, we took the whole state. There's no difference in dental care costs for welfare from one end of the state to the other, regardless of the amount of fluoride in the water, whether it's 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, no difference. So if there was a tremendous benefit, you ought to be able to see that, and it doesn't show up at all in the computer data. So that's why they won't debate you. And although fluoride can help with your teeth, if either chemical is consumed in high amounts over a lifetime, it can lead to cancer, skin conditions, bone disease, and other health issues. I was very angry because nobody had told me about the effects of fluoride. If I'd have known what fluoride would do to the teeth, I would never ever have let her have fluoride toothpaste. There is a recent lawsuit in Maryland, it's a federal lawsuit, a woman who believed the medical establishment at the time when her daughter was an infant, she gave her daughter 90% of her diet intake of, of water was this fluoridated baby water. 
And so the daughter grew up with severe fluorosis, and to get that corrected dental restoration is about $100,000, and they can't bear that burden. So they are suing Nestle and Gerber. So putting it in a baby bottle when the child doesn't have any visible teeth, there's no way on God's green earth that can have anything except a negative impact on that child. But they sell it in the grocery store as baby's first water. I've seen that for years. How do we educate women to not buy this for their babies? And this is why we wanted the warning for infants, because they're the most at risk. They drink their weight in water within two or three days. If you and I did that, we'd be drinking 22 liters a day. I mean, it just goes back to the whole of these regulatory agencies that are supposed to, you know, be kind of looking out for our best interests. And as you know, they're not. I say they have a duty to warn. They have a duty to warn you. Not one manufacturer of formula says, by the way, don't use the tap water. Women, infant, and children, WIC program. We contacted them. They refused to tell mothers not to use the tap water. And you know what she said? It would damage the fluoridation program. Fluoride is safe and effective, and it's one of the most inexpensive ways to really cut down on dental decay. Fluoride is safe and effective. Fluoride is safe, Fluoride is safe and effective. Well, there's a study from 20 years ago showing infant mortality was higher in fluoridated communities. Is that why? I don't know. Why didn't they do a follow-up study? I think that would be interesting to know. Children have died, you know. There's been a case of a child who swallowed this, the dentist left the room, the parents didn't know, the kid swallowed it had to be rushed to hospital, they couldn't save me, died. So yeah, it's very toxic substance. There's no question about that. Is that the kind of stuff that a responsible parent would be putting in their child's hand? FDA in 1997 required manufacturers of toothpaste to put this warning label on it. It's the same as you'd have on a loaded 38 caliber pistol. Keep out of reach of children and only use a little pea-sized amount, which is about the same amount that would be a, pin, a bottle of water and if that amount is swallowed, call the poison control center or seek professional help immediately. So if I drank a bottle of water, should I call the poison control center too? This is just insane. So this is what two different organizations say. One says, don't swallow it. Why did they put that on there? They put that on there because there were 10,000 calls a year to the poison control centers from children made ill by swallowed toothpaste. 10,000 calls. And you know for every call, there's five that didn't call. And so, and there are only poison control centers in half the states. So that means 100,000 children are made ill by swallowed toothpaste. It's insane to put a deadly poison in a child's hand and say, go brush and be sure and spit out, Johnny. Florida has been a slow process of introduction into the dental profession where it's commonplace for us to consider Florida as the thing to do to help decay. Well, we now know, statistics have shown us, that fluoride is not working, but it's very toxic to you and can cause everything from cancer to depression. So, yeah, it's a serious issue. Fluoride is obviously not for everyone. We've now found out that fluoride can harm babies, and we also know that it's been admitted that there are other groups that can be harmed by fluoride. The Center of Disease Control in the 2005 report indicates that Black Americans and Mexican Americans had a higher rate of dental fluorosis than white children. There is a gene that African Americans have too, and so their intestine is grabbing the lead with both hands, and then the Hispanic kids just have one, so they're just grabbing the lead with one hand, and the Caucasian kids don't have either one. So the lowest level of lead is actually in the Caucasian kids, and then Hispanics up 400% and the, Hisp the African-Americans 600% when you put silicone floor in the water. And that's because they have a genetic predisposition. Everybody's dose is different. That's what's critical here. Your dose, my dose, and African-Americans dose, and Hispanic, we all have genetic differences. And that process window may be this big, but you know what? They've decided that everybody gets the same and that's where the problems happen. There's no single dose that is good for everybody. Which makes water fluoridation with hydrofluorosilicic acid a crime against humanity. And it's time for them to stop. What it does, it causes minorities, especially lactose intolerant minorities, to suck up lead like a sponge and end up with learning disorders and be imprisoned for violent crimes. That's 
fluoride gate. So if you want to Google fluoride gate, you will come across the black ministers of America decrying the addition of hydrofluorosilicic acid to the public water supplies because it is a racist policy that causes disproportionate harm. It causes disproportionate harm to babies because they're little people and they drink a lot of water. It causes disproportionate harm to people who are dependent upon the water supply and cannot afford to buy bottled water or buy a nice fancy system that actually takes it out. The president of the Coalition of African American Pastors has said, why wasn't the black community told that blacks are disproportionately impacted by harm from fluorides and fluoridated water? Nobody told me until I learned about this a year ago. It's very expensive for the ordinary family to avoid fluoride once it's in the water, and that is the nub of fluoride gate. That is the nub of why these civil rights people in Atlanta are speaking out, because they recognize that families of low income are unable to avoid this if they wanted to. You can see that when you graph it by race, that there is a lot more injury to the minorities 14% for the Caucasians, 21% for the African Americans, Mexican Americans or 16% have very mild dental fluorosis. Very mild is 25% of the second most damaged tooth. This is insane. The worst damaged tooth, we don't even count that. If it's just one tooth, throw that data out. If it's two teeth that are damaged, it's the lesser of the two evils. When you go to the next one, you see mild, which is 50% of the second most damaged tooth. Caucasians again at four, African Americans at eight, Mexican Americans at five. This is less than 50% of the second most damaged tooth. They call that mild. And then we go to moderate. And this is where the entire surface of the tooth is a chalky white. The National Academy of Science identified this as a health effect. Severe is where parts of the teeth are missing. There's a, a substantial percentage of the children in the United States in fluoridated communities that have severe dental fluorosis, partly from the fluoride tablets, which shouldn't be on the market, partly from swallowed toothpaste, partly from eating things like Cheerios that are 10 parts per million fluoride, partly from drinking the water. How much do they say is safe and of course is it? The EPA has listed four parts per million as being safe. They said, oh, four parts per million is perfectly safe for everybody. Well. One's not even safe for the baby, and they just lowered it down to 0.7. Well, they're headed in the right direction, but not fast enough. When they get it down to zero, I'm going to be okay with that. But otherwise, you know, it, it's not safe. The federal government today recommended lowering the levels of fluoride in your tap water because of growing cases of spotting on the teeth of American children. The recommended reduction is 0 0.7 parts per million. 0.7 is not going to solve the problem because you can do the math on a baby. 0.7 is going to poison the baby. Not quite as fast as one did, but 0.7 is still going to poison the baby because the dose exceeds the dose that's known to cause harm. And you know what the next dirty trick they're trying to do? They're raising the EPA's estimate of the dose that causes harm. I'm sorry, didn't we just figure out that there's a bunch of children with funny looking spotted teeth and we needed to lower their exposure and you're going to raise it? It was explained to me by people in the Netherlands, and particularly Dan, Dr. Hans Muhlenberg. He said, you know, in the Netherlands, we know what it's like as a country to lose your freedom, to live in a totalitarian society, which was run by the Nazis, because the Nazis overran Netherlands. And he said, we know what it's like. You are meant to have the right to informed consent to medication. What we're doing in a Florida community is we're doing to everyone what a doctor can do to no one. A doctor says to you, he says, look, this glass of water is going to do wonderful things for you. It's going to cure your ingrowing toenails. It's going to make you less bald. It's going to do X, Y, and Z. Drink it. And you say, no, I don't want to drink it. You must drink it. You've got to drink it. I'm, I'm your doctor. I'm telling you, you've got to drink it. If he or she tried to do that to you, he or she could lose their license. You're not, you've got to tell the, the patient what the drug is good for, you've got to tell them what it's bad for, the side effects, and then they, in theory, make up their minds. This has been ripped away from us. Water fluoridation is the dispensing of a drug. This is not chlorine. This is not any number of the other 
uh, chemicals that are used to treat the water. Fluoride is being put in specifically to alter you physically, to make a physical change in you. Fluoride is a drug, is a medicine. The majority of our prescription drugs, the primary ingredient is fluoride. Fluoride is a drug. Oh, I didn't know that. No, no, no idea. Well, anytime you see the letters F-L-U-O, you're talking fluoride. Fen-Fen, the diet drug that ruined hearts, well, that was a fluorinated diet drug. Prozac is fluoxetine. It's a fluorinated psychoactive. Matter of fact, all, almost all your psychoactive drugs are fluorinated drugs. They put it in there both as, as a carrier and an accelerator of the effect. The actual active ingredient in Prozac is fluoride. Prozac is made almost entirely from fluoride molecules. It is, and uh, like SSRI drugs are similar molecularly to some of the elements in fluoride. Remember the school shootings in Columbine, Colorado? They were on SSRI drugs. Those drugs make your mind think that you're not living in the real world, that you're actually just sort of experiencing a, a false reality. And I think fluoride has much the same effect. Knowing this, that it is a drug, do you think it's safe to allow the population to be drugged at any dose, doesn't matter how big or small you are, doesn't matter if you're sick, healthy, or elderly? No. There is absolutely no drug on the market that's given in a one-dose-fits-all situation. We don't put other things in the water to try to keep everybody's blood pressure down or everybody's stroke risk down. And there's no reason why we should be trying a one-size-fits-all approach for this either. Once you put a, a medicine in the drinking water, you can't control the dose because you can't control how much water people drink. You can't control who gets it, it goes to everybody. If you ask a pharmacist if there's any drug in his store that was safe enough to give to everyone, young people, old people, sick people, people with poor nutrition, give it to them in any dose, they'd laugh at you. It's ridiculous. There's no way you can give out a medicine without being able to control the dose. And one dose cannot fit all, and you can't give a medicine to everybody. You are forcing it on people who don't want it. There are people in this audience who've spent far more time researching this issue, including David, myself, and many of the people in this audience, and they stated categorically to the mayor, to the city councillors, we do not want you to force this medicine on us. We have the right to informed consent to medication. That's a very important right. This is a violation. It's been violated every day in this country to over 200 million people. There needs to be informed consent. We have that with all other medications. When we go to the doctor, he or she gives us the information of what the side effects are going to be. With fluoride, there is no informed consent. There is no safe dose for one size, this one-size-fits-all medication that they're doing to us. Now, all of those issues are important, but the one that really concerns me is the impact of fluoride on the brain. I, uh... I'm a photographer from Los Angeles, and um, I'm here with these cameras today and because I feel personally driven to do something about this. Once I started looking into it personally and realizing the impact it was having on our children, I decided to do something about it. But my question to you, to the panel, is if the EPA, from what we understand, has uh, found evidence, and they've stated this, that fluoride is a neurotoxin, neurologically, what really is it doing to us? Uh, could you, could you enlighten us on that a little bit? The, a study panel for the EPA, you're absolutely right, listed fluoride as amongst 109 chemicals for which there was significant evidence of neurological effects. It has definite impact on the neurons, which is the nerve parts of your brain. You don't just grow those back. It's not like, well, I cut myself, so now I'm renewing my cell. It doesn't happen to the neurons. There are so many ways that fluoride could be damaging the brain. We know this from animal studies. Dr. Phyllis Mullenix exposed rats to fluoride to work out its effects on the human brain and the central nervous system. What we did was we exposed them, let them drink the fluoride in the water for six to 20 weeks. The pattern that we saw it typically is what we see with other neurotoxic agents that are well known to cause a hypoactivity or uh, a memory problem or an IQ problem. When I first presented the results of these studies, one of the uh, individuals sitting and listening 
to the results. He says, do you have any idea what you're saying? And he says, you're telling us that we're reducing the IQ of children. Look, the first opponents of fluoridation in this country in the 1950s were biochemists. These biochemists had used fluoride in their experiments to poison enzymes. And they, including Dr. James Sumner, who won the Nobel Prize for enzyme chemistry at Cornell, and he said, fluoride poisons enzymes. You don't want to put this substance into the body. Poisoning enzymes is what makes people sick. Poisoning enzymes is what kills people. It's highly likely that you're gonna get subtle effects on the brain that the parent is not gonna notice. No wonder that our children can't read and write. It's no wonder because we're damaging their brains with a stupid preventive dentistry program that doesn't even work. We have behavioral studies and we have 24 IQ studies, 24 studies which now show an association between fairly modest exposure to fluoride and lowered IQ. They've actually got it down to a one milligram dose of fluoride causes a 0.59 loss in IQ points. The average IQ is 100. So if you're 95, you're in the back of the class napping because you can't understand what the person in the front is saying. And you're gonna get a nice job pushing the broom around. So what if you got twice that dose? Okay, you're down to 90. So what they showed in studies in other countries is that you lose all your genius out of your society. You've damaged the intellect. But new research from China supports Dr. Mullenex's conclusion that fluoride affects mental development and IQ levels. I've heard a great deal about a chemical that can be used on the teeth to help prevent decay. Is that a good thing to use? It certainly is. We use a fluoride solution. And we have evidence that for some people... 50 years ago, American government scientists had clinical evidence that fluoride affected the central nervous system. But all this was kept secret. Chemical? You're going to put some chemical in my mouth? All mention of, of the effects of fluoride on the central nervous system was stopped. In my view, fluoride is where lead was in the early 70s. That argument lasted about 10 years, and it was finally proven that, yes, low levels of lead, lower than caused visible symptoms, was in fact damaging a child's mental development. I think the same thing we're going to find with fluoride. As someone who has gotten off of fluoride, I can tell that my thought processes and my concentration is higher. And so when you damage the IQ of the children, you lose your place in the country as a leader, and we have. And that's because of the damage that our government has allowed to happen to the intelligence of our children. If there wasn't research out there that's shown conclusively that it affects the brain and the neurons, that it affects the immune system, that it affects the bones, and it is incorporated into your body, fluoride bonding is strong. You get something with fluoride bonded, it's not easy to get it off. Well, what's going on? Fluoride is now in thousands, and I really mean thousands of products, where it has worked its way in, and I, I don't understand why. I had a good friend of mine come up to me one day when I still live in the valley. He says, Karen, he says, look, there's fluoride in, in Cocoa Pops, and there's fluoride in Fruit Loops, and there's, I'm going, what? What the heck is it doing? And that stuff, pesticides, operate in a lot of cases because they have fluoridated compounds. Sadly, the dentists have begun to add fluoride to their filling materials, their cements, their, they even put a varnish on children's teeth. I don't believe these have been legitimately FDA approved. I've checked on them. There's no uh, new drug applications on file for fluoride to be ingested and none have been submitted. So if you're going to give a child a dose of fluoride, Show me the FDA approval where that's beneficial and even safe. It doesn't exist. I've, I've been collecting water labels from uh, my travels. There's wow. baby water, which is a crime. You can go to a CVS pharmacy right now and you can find a gallon jug of water. It's called nursery water. And it says it's formulated with extra fluoride for growing babies or something like that. It, it should have a skull and crossbones on it. It should be like, if you want to kill your baby, you know, feed them this. It's that bad. There's a lady that was uh, 
crippled by drinking Lipton iced tea. It took almost 10 years for the doctor to figure out what her problem was. She was bent over like this and had terrible back pain and kept going back to the doctor saying, you know, my lower back hurts. They identified the fact that she had skeletal fluorosis and it came from instant Lipton iced tea. And you tested all these waters. All of them. So. And, and all of them contain fluoride. All of them, all of them. It's in so many things that you just don't realize. So one thing that we're learning is that fluoride is virtually in everything. That's why it's so imperative to get it removed from our community, because it's not just our tap water that's contaminated, but the majority of these products contain fluoride. The problem is anything with water in it has this toxic chemical in it, fluoride. Does that that's frighten scary. you? Does it alarm yeah, you? that's really scary, especially since I have a newborn here that's living off formula. So whether it be milk, juice, mustard, ketchup, cereals, and everything. When you water your plants with tap water that is fluoridated, the plants take it up, then you end up eating it. You can't boil it out. Distilled water has fluoride in it as well. You can't evaporate it out. The only way to get it out is to have it turned off. We took with us into, in our documentary in China a, a little uh, fluoride tester from the Lomot, L-A-M-O-T-T-E, Lomot Company. It's called an ion-specific electrode. One thing we should do, Paul, is maybe go see Dave Kennedy and get that fluoride tester. Good idea, then we can test all the products. Let's test all the products. So basically what we have is a means of testing everything under the sun for fluoride, including water, and you can test anything you want to. So what you do is you start off with your standard beneficial dose of fluoride, one part per million. But all you do is you start out here and, and you standardize it, and when it comes to one, you stop it. Gotcha. And then and you're all set. We know it's calibrated because this is one part per million. Exactly. Every restaurant I go into says, oh, we have a filter. And so I always invite them, well, give me, give me a sample and I'll test it for you. So here's the Adams Avenue grill. When you test it, you come up with the same as the tap water. Once you get fluoride in, it's hard to get it out. Is it all right if we use this thing or what? Sure, take it with you. So today is our, our big test day. Paul and I have gone out and we bought the majority of bottled water brands that we could find in my local supermarket. We're gonna test it. We wanna find out what exactly is in it as far as the fluoride and what levels. We're also gonna be looking at tap water today too. And we're doing this with our tracer fluoride pocket tester. This puppy right here is gonna allow us to measure the parts per million of fluoride in pretty much any liquid substance we can get our hands on. So get ready, should be interesting. We'll start with my tap water. These tablets assist the electrode and the tester to pick up the fluoride traces. All right. This is the fluoride added baby water, nursery water since 1948, right around the time we started testing with water fluoridation. So what really blows me away about <coughs> this is why would you need to add fluoride to water that already has fluoride in it? But I guess if it's in a bottle of water with a nice little pretty label of Elmo, it's, it's okay to be drinking and ingesting. It's just what blows me away is where's the poison control number? It should be on every bottle. Did you know that bottled water is not controlled by the government? And guess who does all the research on it? The water companies, the ones making the bottled water. They say this is this, this is this, da da da. If you want to look at what you know, chemicals or trace amount of uh, contaminants are in bottled, different bottled waters, you have to go on the company's websites and go look up their information. And in some case, they won't even provide it to you. I just picked this up as an example when I was down in Cabo San Lucas a few months ago. And you can see it's a bottled water made by Nestle's. And then if you got a really good eyesight and you get your magnifying glass out over here, you can see that uh, uh, it has the elements of calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, bicarbonate, and no fluoride in there. That's the deal. And so you can go to Italy, Germany, France, Holland, Denmark, anywhere in the world except America and pick up a bottle and they'll tell you what's in it. But in America, we'll tell you how much fat there is in it. It's, it's just insane. And you don't have to believe me. Here's San Bernardito from Italy that has bicarbonate, uh, calcio, magnesio, silica. They even tell you how much sand there is in it now. And here's fluoride at 0.06. Here's, here's Primavera from Italy again, and it's got uh, 
bicarbonate, sulfates, chlorine, calcium, magnesium, sodium, silica, and no fluoride in it. Because they, they know people don't want to be drinking fluoride. So if you were in Italy or Europe or someplace else where they actually had reasonable labels on their water, they'd tell you what's in it. Here, they pretend like it doesn't exist. You can get Poland Springs, and all it does is say is since 1845, our natural spring water has been wonderful and good and all that stuff. And they forgot to mention anything. if there was anything in it. So why don't we tell them that here? We don't tell them that here because we want to sell them tap water in plastic. We're going to try calling all these bottled water companies. And supposedly, they will release whether or not they're adding fluoride to their bottled water. Fiji Water Consumer Affairs. Hi, I'm just trying to figure out what levels of fluoride are present in Fiji's water. OK, we do have some natural spring fluoride. It's about 0.26 milligrams per liter. Evian water is pure by nature. We don't add anything to the water. We don't take anything from the water. The water is untouched by men. The fluoride level on the Arrowhead Mountain spring water floats away between no detected to up to 1.3 milligrams per liter. This is naturally occurring at the springs. Is now main added. All right. Thanks so much, Marie. Have a nice day, sir. You too. Bye bye. Bye bye. Reading that script, huh? They're all saying it's that level at the spring. How can those levels be natural? One thing that people really don't understand is, you know, they might, their argument might be, well, I don't drink tap water, or I don't drink any of these brands, or I only drink distilled water. Well, do you cook with it? Because if you're cooking with tap, it's getting right into your food. Do you drink orange juice, or milk, or Gatorade? about Coca-Cola, anything. You gotta realize the water in all these products is just as contaminated. So you can't get away from it. Even if it's organic orange juice, the water is treated with fluoride. And there are gonna be trace levels present. So there is no getting away from it. And the only way of getting away is to have it removed. It's toxic on all levels regardless of the amounts. It's just not supposed to be there. We get enough fluoride from our dental products, whether we're, it's brushing our teeth with fluoridated toothpaste or using a mouth rinse with fluoride. The amount that we're swallowing when we rinse our teeth or brush our teeth is enough, more than enough. And when you find out all the facts and the evidence that fluoride it is not good for you, you must find a way to follow through with your lifestyle. And I say to everybody watching this DVD and this documentary, the water is a right of every human being and no government has the right to tell us what should we drink and when and how. Really, it comes down to this? Yeah, the government's paying 35 dentists at the Center for Disease Control to go out and promote the addition of silico fluoride to the public drinking water. So it's making a lot of people who can't do dentistry money. Where money and power are is a magnet to criminals. And so Washington, D.C. becomes a vortex of evil. And I'll tell you, when you're controlled by a few people, which is the government, who controls the government? Money. Big money. And if they're about money, then we have a conflict of interest. We want our children to grow up healthy and strong, and they want to make profits. There are solutions out there. There are answers to this. There's a ways to get around and, and possibly clean up your system. What can we do? There are some simple things that individuals can do. You can buy a household RO filter, reverse osmosis, mm -hmm. that removes most fluoride, but not all. You can use uh, countertop filters and sink filters. Many of them have, have carbon block elements and other media inside that can uh, collect many of the harmful elements that are packaged along with fluoride. It's, uh, it's called the Berkey filter. It's a uh, two parts component. You fill it up with water. They are two carbon active filter dams. I mean, they're really powerful. They clean every type of metals, every type of chemicals, and also most of the bacteria. I can put water from uh, any type of swamp, put it here and be drinkable. In my house, we've done away with plastic packaging as well. And if you look close enough, you'll notice these five gallon jugs are all glass. These water vendors are virtually everywhere, and the best part about this option is that I can get 25 gallons of the cleanest water I can find for $5. And for those of us that can't afford a reverse osmosis system for our house, it's a good start. Remember, it's all about limiting your exposure.
And, but you know, the big problem is you can get the best water in the world to drink and cook with. But what are you going to do about your shower? In fact, I would even say don't shower in tap water. That's so toxic that, look, where, where I live now, I'm drinking and showering in either rainwater or well water. If we have the ability financially to purchase these filters and these purification systems, it is the most important investment you could make in your, for your family. You really need to invest in yourself, in your food, in what you're drinking, and more than you are your clothes or your electronics or your car. It is the priority. When you accumulate all these chemicals in your body, you have to do something to get rid of it. The antidote to fluoride poisoning is calcium, magnesium, vitamin C, selenium, and iodine. And you can get rid of it with perspiration, which is saunas. You can get rid of it by drinking more water and having it go out in your urine. The right diet can bind to those elements and help clear them out. I am not drinking any more water with fluoride. I'm not eating foods with fluoride. I'm not cooking my pasta rice soups with the fluoridated water. So I completely took it out of my diet. Certain superfoods like chlorella and herbs like cilantro also bind to heavy metals like mercury and help them pass through your body so that they don't get absorbed into your tissues. You know what we should do? Stop buying fluoride toothpaste. Stop buying it. You know, if people started buying the non-fluoridated, guess what they would do? They would start coming out with the non-fluoridated. For example, I buy my toothpaste at Trader Joe, and it is a natural brand, completely natural, for less than what I would pay for the regular garbage. Every product you buy has got a 1-800 consumer number on the side. Flip it over, call them, tell them, I, don't, I won't buy this unless you sell something that doesn't have fluoride. I'm not buying your product anymore. Or, I mean, for anything, where do we start? Politically, physically. There are two strategies for really getting fluoride out of the water supply. One is that you can have the citizens, you know, protest, mm -hmm. go to the city council meetings, rise up against the chemical tyrants, and demand clean water. Just demand clean water, that's it. And if more people would do something like this instead of just turning a blind eye, that's what's wrong with our country. Mm -hmm. People see wrongdoing, but they just pass it by. Let somebody else take care of it. So I imagine you're kind of going to be the Lone Ranger standing up and saying, I don't want my water medicated anymore. We should be calling our congressmen and trying to say, hey, you know. What are you doing out there? What, 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 what are you doing around the well? That's our water. I should have to choose if I'm on fluoride in my water. Why am I demanded that I have to have fluoride in my water? If enough people will contact their legislators contact them either through phone calls, through snail mail. I mean, if they get enough of that on a particular issue, by golly, they do set up and take notice. Go there and bitch, because that's your public servant, okay? Last time I checked, they work for you. You gotta get a lot of people angry enough that they'll go out and stand in the rain and tell the city council that they're not gonna get reelected if they don't do what we tell them. They're not gonna keep their seat if they continue to poison our water. If you follow the democratic process, then this issue has already been solved. Unite and let's make it happen because that's, I was thinking about it today, and I'll just wrap with this, but I was thinking about it today because I knew you were coming over, and I just sat there and I just, I literally just prayed to God. I said, God, I don't know what, there's got to be a way. Open up a way that we can help this nation and the world get its health back and let health be the number one priority and profits the next, not profits over health. And let's let people get the truth. This is all about us taking our world back. It's the time to scream louder, to be bolder, and to show them that we, got, we cannot be afraid. It's time that the people uh, stand up, the silent majority, for, for their health. Get it out of your community, and then you can drink the water at home, you can drink the water in your office, you can drink the water in the restaurants and in friends' houses, so you don't have to worry anymore. All right, folks, so here we are. We're right back where we started in San Diego, right in front of City Hall. Let's recap the whole fluoride thing, shall we? Fluoride is not regulated by the FDA, the CDC, or the EPA. All these regulatory agencies seem to have washed their hands of it. China, Japan, Czech Republic, India, Israel. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Apparently, here in the US, 
There seems to be no debate whatsoever. And according to the ADA, science is on the side of fluoride. Not only are the politicians crooked, but apparently the scientific community is for sale too. Is there any truth? How frightening is that? Let's remember that list of side effects, shall we? We have dental fluorosis, bone disease, thyroid gland suppression, the list of cancers, lower IQs. I mean, don't even take my word for it. Even the EPA has done animal studies that show dementia-like side effects at one part per million. One part per million. That's the level of fluoridation in our tap water. I mean, doesn't that make you sick? That's what got me going. Once I started realizing what's happening to the children, I mean, I couldn't sit still, and I don't know how everybody can just sit back and let this happen. Just please, I beg of you to just look into it. And once you're armed with this knowledge, you'll be able to maybe make the educated decisions to protect yourself, and more importantly, your loved ones. Because isn't that what this is all about? If these regulatory agencies aren't going to do it, then it's up to you. I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. You're such a sweet, sweet soul. <laughs> Again, Charlie, thank you so much for letting us come by here today. Well, I would just like to say, great speech, right? Now. Thank you for all your work you've done over the years and your discoveries and your journey and your just everything. Thank you so much. Appreciate Will. it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Oh, I'll make you do. You're the man. Okay, Thanks thank so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. It's been a treat. It's a pleasure to talk to you, and, and I'm hoping that this will get the message to more and more people. Now, this is fantastic. It's going to be a great educational tool, and, and we appreciate you being here. And thank you so much, and we'll look forward to, look forward to seeing you again. Likewise. Thanks for having me. You guys are incredibly powerful, and I want to say thank you for what you're doing for all of us. I really wish this project the greatest success. People need to hear this message from all, the, all of those that you've interviewed, this is powerful information. And uh, I imagine that in 50 years, people will be watching this. You know, some DVDs will survive. Yeah. Yeah. I just got the chills. <laughs> and they'll be watching this, and they'll look back and say, uh, there were some filmmakers who did know what they were covering, who weren't willing to just sell out and, and do some explosions and on-screen sex and this and that. They actually had a message for humanity. That's what you guys are doing. So with that being said, that concludes our water. Part one of a three-part series, The Great Culling. We still need to tackle our food and our air because they're just as contaminated as the water we drink. Thanks again and God bless.
metaphysical, spiritual, illuminati, watch your mind and soul, conspiracy, no not me, research yourself and you'll see, think hard, they pull the card, got your uncle stuck on crack, oh, big rims on cheap cars, got you thinking that you ballin' dog, couple babies for a time, Marisol, flat parenthood trying to cut your balls, McDonald's all the men get cancer dog, but I bet you didn't know that at all, fake alien attack will start it all, to put that mark on all of y'all, like in the holocaust, go murder y'all, so what you choose, fight or fall, it's the way you call, it's the way you call, Thank <laughs> you.